what I want to do today is go a little bit over the homework template. Um, I assigned uh, the first homework uh, today, and I'm hoping you're getting notifications for those. I did send an email this morning uh, reminding you if you're not getting any notifications from my course from Canvas, make sure you turn on those notifications. So sometimes I send you emails, sometimes I create an announcement. I, I create an announcement, it's easier because you can always find the, find the announcement on Canvas in one place, rather than having to go search through this, your email, like where did he tell us about this or that, so the announcements are easier. Make sure you have notifications turned on, so you can see when, you can, you can see when, you can hear when, uh, you can know when I make an announcement, okay? Your first homework has been assigned today, it's fairly easy and straightforward. Problem one is going to be you going over some Python slides that I created. Um, you don't have to submit anything for that. And problem two is a um, discussion on errors, so which we will start covering today. Um, I first want to show you the, explain to you the process of the um, homework expectation. Um, let me see, move. Okay. I apologize about the flickering. Um, it's... Uh, Maybe we should just turn off this, uh, yeah. Is there any way that you can, uh, I mean, so Jeff Gilcox, he was teaching this classroom last semester, mm -hmm. a lot of us were in here. Yeah. Wi-Fi wasn't working then. Yeah. Still not working. Got it. I, I had a comment about that, yeah. Okay, so I'll bring this up with um, uh, technical. If in the meantime, uh, work with your colleague if they have a, um, if they have their internet working, or, you know, if you, I, I'm sorry about that, it's really annoying, right? And it's happened with me, actually. Um, the other option is to just have a local installation of Anaconda, um, but thanks for bringing that up. I'll, I'll talk to the college and see what they can do. Is it not working for you today? Uh, oh, so I have Uconnect right now and it's working. Pardon me? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and it's, it's crazy because, you know, you're, it's this big, big system, right? And we expect it to work, so, all right. Let's not worry about fixing the internet right now. If you're having trouble, you can follow with me on, um, on the screen. Okay, and this screen needs to be fixed clearly. Um, all right. But I wanted to share with you some of the expectations uh, about the homework assignments. So what you're looking at here, if you can follow with me please, is uh, a file called ho homework template that you will find on Canvas under files homework. Okay, so that homework template um, is what I'd like you to use and what I, what I expect your homework to look like. See, at the beginning, you got your, um, the title of the homework, your name, and your unit. That's not my unit, by the way. Um, and you will have your problem statement as a PDF that you're going to be reading, and this is where you're going to be solving the problems, right? So I'd like you to Talk about the homework. So here I'm saying this homework template contain, can, is it, this is a homework template contains generic set of problems, et cetera. You could say, you know, this is homework one, we are looking at errors in this homework one if you want, or not say anything. But then what's important is to have this a proper formatting here that we can read and understand. So this is problem one, question one, you don't have to retype the entire question. Some questions are lengthy. They're like one paragraph long. I don't expect you to type that back. But I'd expect you to kind of uh, think about what you're doing and write that. Say, you know, in this question, we are going to solve for the temperature in the, in, a, uh, in the wall or in the rod, right? That's enough so that I know that you understood the question, right? And then you should provide a solution, okay? So you see this is a heading, this is a subheading, this is a subheading, okay? And then... See how I'm mixing text? This is a text cell. 
Okay, to compute the true error, we first need to compute the true value of the derivative. Set up this is given by this and such and such. And then I have some code over here. Now notice my code is doing something and it's printing a value that says true, it's printing something. This is not a discussion. This does not count as a discussion. This counts as a, as a discussion. You could say that now that we have computed the true value or the true value is 4.5, now that we have that value, we need to compute an approximation. So I want you to have to, to discuss what you're doing, okay? Now the benefit of that is that kind of forces you into a linear thinking process. What is a linear thinking process? It's a step-by-step -step process where you're moving one step to the next sequentially. Our minds are complex and we think non-linearly. We're like all over the place. You know, I've, you had a, if you had a discussion with me in my office, I'm all over the place, right? And we all tend to think non-linearly. We jump over ideas all over the place. But in a report, in a scientific report, you need to be as linear in your thought process as can be, okay? So this step-by-step -step forces you to stick with a linear thought profile, okay? Then I explain what I'm doing. So in this case, um, I need to evaluate an approximation for the derivative. To do this, it's best to define a Python. I'm explaining what I'm doing, okay? You might do it differently, but explain it, okay? In this case, I'm, doing, I'm defining a Python function that computes the derivative. Let's call that function df. The df function will take three arguments. The function that we're differentiating, the value of x, and the value of the um, of h and return whatever that means. You'll learn about that later, but this is just a template. We also have to define another Python function for our function that we're evaluating the derivative for. So I explain that, okay? And then I write the code, okay? See, my function is this guy and then df this is the derivative. Now we can compute the approximate values. Go ahead and co compute, do my code, whatever you wanna do here. And again, I'm printing things out and it's good to print things out. Okay, it's good to print things out, but this is not a discussion. As far as we're concerned, oh, error with h 0 0.5 is 0 0.609, and error with h 0. Point, that is meaningless because it's always out of context, okay? However, this is useful. The true error when using h 0 0.5 is et 0 0.37, and for h 0 0.05, it's et 0 0.034, about one order of magnitude smaller than the error with h equals 0 0.5. This, if I take anything out of this homework assignment, it's this statement, the interpretation of your finding, okay? So try to get to that point, okay? That is kind of a long-term expectation of you as an engineer is to try to get to a point where you are interpreting the results. You will find in the homework assignments, I will always ask you a question, what does this mean? Interpret your result, okay? At some point, you might not be asked that question. You will not be asked that question, but implicitly you have to do that interpretation, okay? Then we go to question two. You type in question two. We are asked to do this and that, and then we provide a solution and et cetera, et cetera, and you know, you're done, okay? When you're done with this, okay, now some of you um, have done Jupyter Notebooks before, I don't even need to tell you that, but for the rest of you, here's what I expect next. Two things, file, download as, notebook. You see, this IPYNB extension that stands historically to IPython Notebook. These Jupyter Notebooks used to be called IPython, just like iPod or iMac, et cetera. They used to be called IPython Notebooks. And initially, you know, in like 2013 or so, they were quite unique at the time, right? So they, and the extension stuck. So you download that file, Notebook, okay? So it downloads it into your downloads folder, whatever that does, okay? But then, or you can browse in your directory to where that file is, okay, and, and just copy it. That needs to be submitted to Canvas, okay? That file needs to be submitted to Canvas. Also, there's one more file that needs to be submitted, with, which is a PDF version of this notebook. Now, this is where the disaster happens. Because each computer, each 
platform has a different setup that n usually none of the functions that are provided by the built-in Jupyter Notebook work, usually to convert to a PDF. Try it, and if it doesn't work, there's always another option. The first option would be go to File, Download As, there is a PDF via LaTeX. Now, I have LaTeX on my laptop, so I do expect this to work. But probably it might not. So, okay. It's uh, doing something. Maybe because there's no internet. Although it's a local host. So, let me see if it worked. It's going to show up on this screen over here. Okay, so it did work, and it created a PDF um, uh, window. It created this PDF, okay? Very beautifully formatted PDF. You upload this as well, please. So up, uh, don't zip them into a zip folder or a RAR archive. Upload them individually as files, okay? Because when we go and grade, we're going to look at the PDF first. Okay, and we're going to grade the PDF. So that's how you do it. You finish, you're done with your notebook, save it, download it, do it, convert it to PDF, and that's it. Okay? Okay, if that doesn't work for you, go back and try file, download as PDF via HTML. Okay? Look, it gave me an error here. On my computer in the office, it didn't give an error. It might not give an error on your end. I don't know, okay? I have no control over that. If that doesn't work, go to File, Print Preview. Okay, this almost always 99.999%, like that thing on the bacterial sanitizer kills 99.999% of 10 trillion bacteria. So that, that works. 99.9999% of the time, okay? Once you're done here, you can either just print it to PDF, so I could go and just print it to PDF, save as PDF, or use your PDF printer on your Windows machine, okay? That will almost always work. Okay, now if you're still getting in trouble with that, okay, and you, you're freaking out, you're stressed, you have five minutes to submit, email me and Nicholas and Brooke before the midnight mark, send an email, say, hey, I'm having trouble converting to PDF, I'm gonna upload the notebook. So then we have a record like, yeah, you know, that's fine, we'll figure it out um, later. Don't worry, you know, we're gonna assume that you have the PDF uploaded, but make sure you send that email. Don't wait two days uh, like, oh, I didn't upload my homework because I didn't, I wasn't able to convert it to a PDF. No, let us know beforehand. Then we'll figure it out with you, figure out what's going on on your laptop, and then you can upload the PDF later, okay? Promise me you will do that. It will really relieve a lot of heartache, okay, and complex discussions. If you are having trouble converting to a PDF, what I would do now, get this download, get this homework template, and go try to convert it to PDF right now, and figure it out right now. Okay, not five minutes before homework is due. If you want to wait for five minutes before homework is due, it's not working, send us an email, please, on, through Canvas, okay? In Canvas, to send an email, there's a mailbox on the left menu. Click on it. You'll be able, it's very obvious, you'll be able to select where you want to send your email. You can select numerical methods 2450. You can select the TAs, your colleagues, myself, okay? In all communications with related to work in this class, copy me, copy Brooke, and copy Nicholas, please. So we have a chance between the three of us to address any of your concerns, okay? Okay. Hopefully that's clear. Okay. You upload both the IPYNB file. On my end, it downloads it automatically into a downloads folder. On, you might have a Windows machine, might put it in your documents folder or whatever. Um, you figure that out, okay? But download, upload both files, okay? Okay. Now, two more things. For those of you who are new to these Jupyter Notebooks, you will notice 
What's cool about these notebooks is that I can put high quality rich text, okay? I can put mathematics in here that looks beautiful, okay? And I can also put code. That is the power of Jupyter Notebook. It's like the iPhone. When, when Steve Jobs introduced the iPhone, I remember he said, this is a, a telephone, an internet navigator, and whatever, something else, all in one. This is the Jupyter Notebook. It's the iPhone of programming. Okay, it is a text editor, it's a coding platform, it's a rich text editor, it's a math thing. Okay, it's perfect, all in one place, yes? You want to use that? Use that. I don't mind, but as long as you give me a Jupyter Notebook in the end. Okay. Yeah, I don't mind, but it's a little bit too much for this class. Okay, so I want to achieve the maximum outcome with the minimum effort. Okay, yeah. You can do VS Code. We got a couple of, colleague, couple of your colleagues are using VS Code, and it supports a Jupyter Notebook as well. So but as long as you can produce this, you know, a rich text with coding, I'm fine with that, I don't mind, okay? Okay, two more things. Now, yeah, so how do we do this? The secret to this is something called, is a, is a language, okay, is a programming language called Markdown. That just looks like English, but it's actually a programming language that is converted behind the scenes into text. So this Markdown, notice here, if I put a, um, this symbol, that gives me a, a title heading. Two of those give me a second heading, a heading two. Three of those is going to give me a heading three, and so on. Notice that. So when I click, double click on this cell, this text cell, okay, I can write markdown code, which is converted into text. Okay? In your homework one, first problem, I'll, you'll go over some of those. Okay. Now. It's fairly straightforward because if you've done, if you've, if you've contributed to any online forums, they have a similar type of language that they use there to format things, okay? Um, so you just use that. You, frankly, will not need anything more than a heading, a subheading, and just standard text, okay? Now, how do I create math, okay? I'm hoping that you will, instead of writing math like this, so let me show you the difference. Okay. Oops. So let's say you want to write, you know, Newton's law says that mass times acceleration equal, you know, sum of or equal F, okay? Now, I get it that you're saying MA equal F, or F equal MA, but you can write it more elegantly by using another language for math, which is called LaTeX, okay? Don't expect you to know LaTeX, and I'll give you a little trick to convert, to automatically get your LaTeX equations into Markdown. Okay, now imagine you go and do this instead. I'm going to put a dollar sign. A dollar sign means this is a LaTeX equation. Okay, and I type M times A equals summation of forces. Now look how beautiful that is. This is math. Okay, now how do I do this? I used the LaTeX language. Okay, LaTeX is a language developed by Donald Knuth, okay, it's a beautiful language, okay, it produces beautiful text, especially beautiful mathematics, okay. Now, yeah, it's going to take some time, you see here, begin equation, f prime, backslash, approx, backslash, frac, it's a language, okay, and I don't expect you to know, it takes time to learn it, okay. Instead, what we, what you can do is, Go to what's called a LaTeX equation editor online. It's like a nice user interface like MathType that you've used in Word or whatever the math editor in Word, where you go with your mouse and select symbols and things like that. You create your equation there and ask it to give you the LaTeX source code, right? 
ask it to give you the LaTeX source code. So frankly, there's a ton of them out there. So what, um, what I'm going to try to do here is to see if I can find a good one. Editor online. Let me see. Uh, okay, like this is a good one here. Let me see. Okay, move. So if you just Google LaTeX equation editor online, um, there's a bunch of them. Different ones are, you know, might, you know, work better for you, but like, you know, there's math, there's symbols, et cetera. And it automatically translates translates the LaTeX for you over here. Okay, so let's say you want to do a um, uh, uh, let's say you want to do square root of a b, right? So you do square root of a b, square root of b, a b, right? So then you you can go and put c, right? That's square root a b c. Now you copy this, okay, and put it back in the um, uh, you put it back in the markdown. Let me try this other one here. Um, from Lagrida. Okay, so let's say I want MA equal, um, uh, summation of forces equal MA. Oh, look, there's a sum over here, summation. I'm going to type sum. Oh, it gave me a sum with under and up and then F. If I type F over here, equal MA. Okay. You play with that. I know you'll figure it out. It's Try to look through different ones, online logic equation. I, I don't use those anymore. There's even some of them where you actually write the equation and take a picture, and it will convert it to LaTeX for you. For the most part, we're not going to use fancy equations. So very simple things like a derivative and a fraction. You'll get used to that within a couple of help sessions, first couple of assignments. We're not going to be annoying about this. So if you write your equation in the markdown text, that's fine, okay, for the first few homeworks. But I'm hoping by the fourth homework, you have had a chance to see the power of LaTeX, okay? Because ask yourself, if someone is giving you a report that's nice and clear, you can tell that the math looks different from the text, you're like, yeah, this is a nice homework. This is a nice report, right? So try to think of it this way. Okay. Nicholas and Brooke and myself, but Nicholas and Brooke in the help sessions are going to be a wonderful resource for this. In fact, Brooke created a markdown um, guide for you, which I have also put up on, la on the canvas. Let me move it over here. So I think... She developed that in 2450 last semester, and it explains all the features of Markdown, how you do bullet points, how you do um, uh, bullet num numbered bullets, et cetera, how you do equations, and things like that, okay? So that's also on Canvas, okay? Now, why don't I spend two lectures on going through this? Because this is not a word course or like a, you know, text editing. I mean, these are things you pick up along the way as a scientist, as an engineer. Every course you pick up a little bit, and then, you know, by the end, you've mastered them. Okay? All right, great. Let's now move on to, okay, Siri. Never understand me, Siri. <laughs> okay. All right, so now let's move on to lecture mode. How about that? Okay? All right. I want you to pick up a sheet of paper right now, fold it like the TA team yeah. has shown us here. Thank you, guys. All right? So pick up a sheet of paper, okay, and write your name on it and put it in front of you. Next time, maybe you might want to get a slightly stronger cardboard or heavier paper. Put your name on it. Ooh, however, I, I don't know. How long is your, how long is your name? <laughs> 
yeah, it's just a name tag. I just want to, yeah, so fold it on the shorter side. Okay, put your name on it. Because I, I want to learn your names, okay? It's easier for you all to remember one extra name. It's harder for me to remember 70 names. So every time I see your name on the name tag, I'm going to associate your face with the name, and then I can, when I'm you know, walking down the hall, I can call you and talk to you, okay? So put your names. Make the font a little bit legible so I can read it from a distance. Maybe next time I'll get you some heavier paper so that it looks like more of a cardboard. Like this magnificent, this beautiful font, TAs. <laughs> I actually have a Sharpie if you want to borrow it. I have a couple of Sharpies. Yeah. There you go. Pa pass it around. No. <laughs> uh, do you want Sharpie? Pass it around. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Big letters. Let it shine. Sharpie markers. Let me see. Pardon me. I, I don't know. I'm gonna call you Miles. I don't care. I'll, uh, if I can't read your name, I'll ask you. Yeah. Do you guys want a marker? Yeah. No, I can see it. I can see it. Yeah. Pass around. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever, yeah, however you want to be called. So, yeah, Abigail's fine. <laughs> I just want to I just want to know you, right? I just want to know who you are. Okay? Wow, I can see that from space. <laughs> hey, pass around the marker. Yeah, pass the markers around. Okay. Uh, are you, if you're done with the marker, oh, sorry, sorry, never mind. Yeah, perfect. Mostly chemi majors, yeah, but I sometimes get from mechanical engineering or civil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, hopefully now you get to know everyone. Are you a chemi? Yeah, so hopefully now you'll get to know everyone and everyone gets to know you. <laughs> All right. Okay. Now that you got your name sorted out, I want you to self-select into groups of four or three at the minimum, groups of four at the maximum. Look to your left, look to your right. If you don't know your colleague, introduce yourself. Ask them to introduce themselves to you. Get to know them. Self-select into groups and start thinking about a group name, okay? Okay, guys. Uh, may I have your attention, please? May I have your attention, please? This is your captain speaking. For those who have uh, written their names down, please self-select into groups of four or three at the minimum. Look to your left, to your right. Pick a colleague, okay? And give your group a name and make it funny. It's up to you. No. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We can, we can switch groups if it's not working. But the purpose, maximum is four. Well, you can do whatever you want. He's abandoned chip. Hey, hey. And it's okay to join groups of peers that you don't know because the purpose is to get you all to know each other, okay? Start thinking of a name for your groups, please.
You guys, just the two? Yeah, they cannot. <laughs> you cannot be. Well, they are the TA group here. <laughs> um, mm. Well, I'm okay if you want to be your own group. It's okay. Yeah, if there's, there's another two, I think, in the back or three, that's going to be like a long distance uh, uh, group relationship. <laughs> All right. Okay, I'll give you one more minute for group names. You don't have to come up with the group name today. You can work through it over the weekend and have a group name by next Tuesday. Because from now on, I'll be calling on the group name, okay? And if it's funny and hilarious, I'll probably never call that group. Do you have a group name? Rainbow Row. Rainbow Row. R squared. <laughs> All right, so that counted both as a break and a uh, group formation. Um, we're going to get back to lecture mode right now. Okay, so my expectation of these groups is for you to be as loud as possible. I want when you are doing an activity. <laughs> okay? So I'd like you to listen to me when we're like in lecture mode, be focused, but once, once it's an activity, I want you to be loud. I want this room to be buzzing. I want the dean to send someone, tell us to shut up, okay? And fix the internet. And fix the internet. <laughs> okay? So that's how it's going to be. We're going to start with our first activity, and these first activities are going to be simple and kind of like silly, okay? But just to get the process moving, okay? So now the first group activity is, what is x minus x minus 1? Go. Start talking. Buzz. Be loud. Okay, have an answer. Have an answer. Yeah. All right, what's your group name? One. <laughs> so we got an answer. Uh, Rainbow, Row? Rainbow Road? Rainbow Road. Road, Road. Rainbow Road. Okay. One. Okay. Who, anybody disagrees? Yes. It's negative one. <laughs> okay, X is a real number. X is a real number. <laughs> okay. So now, all right, let's do this again. So now, we got two, three groups said that the answer is one. And I think everybody agrees. This is simple mathematical operation. X minus X is zero. Minus times minus one, minus one times minus one is one. So the answer for a reasonable person should be one. Okay. Now go do this in Python. Open up your Python notebooks and use value of x of 10 to the power 16, okay? And write down this formula, x minus x minus 1. What do you get? Work as groups. You can share it all on one laptop. If your internet is not working, one of you has the local installation. Zero. You got zero. Yeah. So the computer is being unreasonable, right? <laughs> I guess. Okay. So we got a zero with Rainbow Road. What's up? Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. 
round off error. Yeah. So, so what happens? So now, now remove the parentheses. <laughs> Keep the parentheses. Yeah, so, so it would be minus x plus 1 yeah. then, but it will be the right answer. Why? So you're spot on. So here, it gave priority to the parentheses always. x minus 1 and x is a large number, 1 disappears. So the answer of x minus 1 is 10 to the minus 16. Uh huh. Then, exactly. Yeah. So take out the parentheses. All right. So we got a 0 over here. We got a 0. Who else got a zero? Yeah? Yeah? Okay. Yeah. Does that surprise you? Does that destroy your trust in computers? In fact, grab your calculator, your fancy calculator, and do the same thing. It's going to give you zero. Okay? Grab a fancy calculator. <laughs> if, you still, if those still exist. Okay? Do it on your laptop. Okay? Do it on your computer. It's going to give you zero because on a non-fancy one, you can't do parentheses, right? So you have to have one that can do a, a parentheses. Okay. So indeed, you get a zero. And if it, that doesn't surprise you, then you've probably seen this before. But this is what we're going to talk about in, the, in this chapter, okay? This type of error that we committed over here or that the computer committed is called a round-off error. And it's the result of computers not being able to represent numbers that are arbitrarily large or arbitrarily small. Okay, we're going to learn about that a little bit. Now, repetitive use of these round-off errors can cost lives. Okay, can cost lives. You can see that on homework two. Okay, a real-life situation where round-off caused the loss of life. Okay, it can also cause huge disasters. Okay, let's listen to this story. Unfortunately, I cannot connect the audio to the, um, uh, to, the, to, the, to the room. So you're going to have to try to listen in to the speakers. Okay, I'm going to try to put this microphone here. It's the 4th of June, 1996, and the European Space Agency is launching its brand new Ariane 5 rocket for the first time. This is a big deal. The Ariane 5 is designed to carry large, expensive scientific and commercial payloads into space and heralds a brand new era for the ESA. A decade of design and testing and billions of euros have led up to this day. The Ariane 5 rocket carries no astronauts. The first payload is four very expensive scientific satellites to be delivered into orbit. Things start well. The rocket clears the tower and accelerates smoothly. And then the rocket abruptly changes direction, starts to break apart, and suddenly explodes. Less than a minute after launch, huge chunks and glowing fragments of Ariane Flight 501 rain down over the launch area. A shocking disaster for Ariane and the ESA. The cause? A simple, utterly avoidable coding bug. Okay, here's what happened. The Ariane 5 leaves the launch pad and accelerates smoothly into the sky following its predetermined path towards space. Inside, the onboard guidance system is constantly tracking the rocket's trajectory and sending the data over to the main flight computer. To do so, the guidance system converts the velocity readings from 64-bit floating point to 16-bit integer. Okay, stop for a second and let's think about what that actually means. Computers store numbers in a variety of ways. Consider 4-bit integers. 4 bits can represent anything from 0 to 15. But if you want to represent the number 16, well, there just aren't enough bits, are there? 16 is too big. You need more bits to store bigger integers. With 16 bits, you can store anything from 0 to 65,535. Or, if you throw in a sign, then 16-bit signed integers cover everything from minus 32,768 to positive 32,767. But anything bigger than that, and again, you run out of bits. Floating point numbers are stored a bit differently. They're stored as a decimal, or significant, and an exponent. The details aren't really important here. All you need to know is that 64-bit floating point can store much larger numbers than 
them can fit into a 16-bit integer. So converting between them can be tricky when it runs out of bits. You're definitely getting the wrong answer. Overflow. Right, so back to our rocket. The guidance system reads the horizontal velocity down to the rocket, a 64-bit floating point, and tries to convert that into a 16-bit integer to send over to the main flight computer. But at that moment, the velocity reading is actually larger than the largest possible 16-bit integer. The system tries to do the conversion and fails. Now, a clever system would have some procedure built in that says, hang on, we're piloting a rocket here. I need to say something sensible to the main computer. It would have some overflow error handling code. But in this case, guidance system code isn't very clever. So it just sends an error message in place of the velocity data and promptly shuts down. Fortunately, there's a backup guidance system in case the primary module breaks down. Unfortunately, it's running the same code, so it does the same conversion, gets the same overflow, and crashes for the same reason. The main computer receives the error message, and because there's no handling code built in, the computer interprets the message as real navigational data, and immediately freaks out. The velocity reading is off the charts, indicating that the rocket is dangerously, impossible, off course. So the flight computer does what it's designed to do. It fires up the boosters and drags the rocket around in an attempt to rescue itself from a non-existent disaster. This puts the fuselage under incredible aerodynamic strain, which starts tearing the rocket apart. Detecting that things are now really going badly, the computer calls it a day and triggers the built-in self-destruct mechanism. So, what was the ultimate cause of this incredibly expensive, very short and ultimately catastrophic rocket flight? A simple line of code, converting a floating point to an integer that led to an overflow, passed without warning to the main computer, which was interpreted as real, if wildly inaccurate, data. The flight software had been used previously with no problems on many flights of the smaller Ariane 4 rockets, but the Ariane 5 was designed to fly faster than anyone planned for when the software was originally written. And the higher velocity led to the overflow error, a flaw that should have been found. It just never came up. Want to know the worst bit? That buggy bit of code wasn't even necessary during the flight. It was part of the launch pad alignment process and shouldn't have been running after liftoff. But sometimes, a small glitch somewhere causes a launch to be delayed by a few seconds. So to save having to reset the system, the original programmers decided to keep that bit of code running for 40 seconds after the scheduled lift on time. Oh, damn. <laughs> yep. All right. All right. Okay. So this is this is real stuff. Okay? This is real stuff and this is only one type of error that you will encounter in numerical methods. It's called round off error. And it's the inability of a computer to store numbers larger than it can sustain. In the example we did at the beginning, that x plus 1 or x minus 1 in the parentheses, Python is evaluating that first. And with the standard precision that Python uses, 10 to the, minus 16, 10 to the power 16 is the largest it can handle. So adding 1 to it, is not going to make any effect. So you get 10, so you get x minus 1 equals still 10 to the 16. And when you subtract that from 10 to the 16, it gives you 0. That's why you got 0, okay? Now in practice, this is not going to be an issue, especially with modern software, but if you're converting between numbers, it will be an issue. Okay, so let's talk about errors. This is our first chapter. We're going to start easy. Errors are something that you've heard of, you've... Um, worked with in the past, um, I like to have a set of learning objectives in each chapter so that at the end of the chapter, when you're studying for your exam, when you're reviewing the material, you can look at the learning objectives and say, did I master that objective? And I hope that you will, okay? 
So at the end of this chapter, we, you should be able to define and calculate true error, define and calculate relative true error, same thing for approximate error, relative approximate error, identify when you need to use a true error or when you can use a true error, and when you need an approximate error, identify when a relative error is necessary, um, which is most of the time, List the common errors encountered in numerical analysis. Those are going to be round off, truncation, and iteration error. And given a certain problem, I'm hoping that you'll be able to identify what error, you, what type of error you're dealing with. And finally, write Python code that evaluates the Taylor series of a function. So you've probably seen the Taylor series. It's a way to approximate complex um, complex transcendental functions, okay, as polynomials. So we're going to learn how to do that in Python, okay? We will start with the simple concept of the true error. And I'll give you a definition. You'll see three colored boxes in my slides. A gray colored box is a definition. A blue colored box is an activity that is based on a discussion or work that you're going to do by hand. And a greenish box is a coding activity. Those are the three boxes you'll see on the sl in the slides. So hopefully they will help you figure out as you're kind of searching for something, figure out where you have a definition or an activity. Okay. Siri, you don't know about errors. Okay. So true error, also known as absolute true error, is defined as the difference between the true value of something and its approximate value. Remember, numerical methods is all about approximating things, okay? So we define the true error as, in this class, capital E sub subscript T. You will find many different symbols used for it. But here in this class, this is the nomenclature we're adopting. Capital E subscript T refers to a true error. And it's simply the true value minus the approximate value, or often reported as an absolute value, okay, so that would be called the absolute true error. I'll be very explicit in, the, in an exam or in homework telling you, hey, calculate the absolute value of the true error. Okay, so you simply put an absolute value um, so you don't get a signed error, minus or positive, okay? Pretty simple, right? So let's go ahead and do an activity. Go back into your groups now, and your job here is to approximate the derivative of a function using the standard derivative approximation that you've used in high school, okay, which is rise over run, fx plus h minus f of x over h. So that's the rise over the run. Okay? So that's a simple approximation for a first derivative, okay, where h over here is some small value. We are going to choose that value. So we're going to approximate, we're going to evaluate this approximation for the function 2 times exponential to the 0.5x. And your job is to find the true error in evaluating f prime of 3 using h equals 0.5 and h equals 0.05. You got to do this by hand on your worksheet. Okay, you can use your calculators. Okay, go ahead, work as groups. Mm -hmm. Uh, on your, on your, yeah, by hand. So it's not a Python assignment. No, 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 no. These are just activities in class. Yeah, and by hand, I mean no Python. So you can do it on your tablet or however you're taking notes. Yeah, or, or you can, if you don't have sheets, you can work together. So these are the types of calculations you will be doing in an exam, okay? So you need to know the true value of the derivative and then use the approximation of the derivative and take the difference, okay? Use your calculators. McKenna, are you with a group or? Oh, okay, okay, yeah, <laughs> okay.
Okay, so get the exact derivative value. So first evaluate f prime of the function, then evaluate that at x equal 3. Okay, so you compute f prime of 3, you get the true value. Then com compute the approximate value. That was the definition of the true error. True value minus approximate value. Okay? So you're finding you want we wanna we have an approximation for the derivative that why, is this formula. Why is it uh, an approximation? Why can't we just find the derivative? Because the derivative of two e to the zero point five. That's a great point. We're gonna get to that. I agree with you, and we're gonna get to that point. But the purpose of the exercise to, to do a to compute a true error. Just in a few moments, I'm going to ask the question like, does this even make sense? Because we can evaluate it exactly. Okay. Right? And so, then my next question is so, to do this example, um, you want us to basically use that approximation for the derivative, and you want us to use the two different h values, and then mm -hmm. we're subtracting one from the other, or are we just have No, you're, you're evaluating the true, va the true error. So, with h equals 0 0.5, is going to give you one approximation. Subtract that from the true value, and that gives you an error. Right? A true error. What's the, true value? the true value is f prime of three, f prime. which is the derivative of the when you when you said it's not a hard to evaluate. Oh, okay. So that's the exact value, right? Oh, okay. True oh, value is the exact error. value, okay. right? Yeah. H is the error. No, h is not the error. H is just a parameter in the approximation. Okay. So we have an we have the exact derivative, which is like you said, it's not hard to evaluate, right? It's not hard to take the derivative of the exponential, etc. You evaluate that. That's the true value. That's the exact value, the true value. Okay? Now we have an approximation for the derivative. Suppose you didn't know how to evaluate that derivative, but you just have the true value of it. I'm asking you to compute the error committed by using that approximation. So is that approximation the true value? It's an approximation. It's an approximate value. The true value is the exact value which you would evaluate by differentiating f of x. Just do the analytical dif differentiation and evaluate it at 0.3. You're overthinking this. Okay, so let's see. Um, I'm not going to ask for answers. I kind of heard most of you discussing this. So let me show you how I would do this. Um, so there was a question of what we mean by true value. The true value is the exact value. So in this case, we have a function f of x, which is 2e to the 0.5x. Okay. What we want to evaluate the derivative of this function at x equal 3. Right? Clearly, we can differentiate this analytically by hand. right? So that gives us the true value, or the exact value. Okay. Now, the true error is going to be the difference between using this approximation and the true value. Now, this approximation depends on a parameter h which is arbitrarily chosen. Here I'm telling you use 0.5 and use 0.05. Okay, so let's see how that works. Okay, we first compute the true value of f prime 3 for f of x equal 2 e to the 0.5 x. So the derivative analytically, right, because we can evaluate that analytically, we know what it is, it's going to give us the true value is f prime of x e to the 0.5 x, right? So derivative of e to the x, e to the alpha x is alpha e to the x, right? Uh, alpha e to the alpha x. Okay. So that gives us f prime of x. That's the true, that's the exact solution. Okay. Now evaluate that at point 3. So that gives you an exact solution for the derivative of this function at point 3. Okay. Now you want to evaluate the approximation. Okay. You want to evaluate the approximation. We have the formula for the approximation. So I kept the true value here on the side. The approximation is f of x plus h minus f of x over h. And h is this parameter that is arbitrarily chosen. The approximate value for h equals 0 0.5. You simply plug in the numbers. 
f prime approximate at 3 is f at 3 plus 0 0.5 minus f at 3 over 0 0.5, right? So the value here of the approximation is really that you didn't have to use an analytical derivative. You just used the function itself. So suppose you're flying on an airplane, right, and you have this complex, uh, crazy function that you can't differentiate. You forgot how to differentiate. But you need to evaluate a derivative for some reason. You're doing something in your mind, doing a project. You just use a derivative approximation, okay? You don't need the analytical derivative in that case, okay? So in this case, with, a, with h equals 0 0.5, this is our derivative approximation, okay? And finally, the true error is the difference between the true value or the exact value and the approximate value, okay? It gives us a number, 0 0.60997, and I'm botching, botching my significant figures over here, but just for illustration purposes, okay? So now you do the same with another value of h. Okay? If you can, if you can stay with me, please. What do you expect a smaller value of h to produce in terms of error? Why? Yes, and? Okay, yes, yes. The H is closer to zero. So if you remember your derivative definition, go ahead. H approaching zero, yes. Uh -huh. That's what you're going to say? Same thing, okay. So what your colleagues are saying is that if you remember uh, the definition of the derivative was this definition, but in the limit that h approaches 0. So as h gets closer and closer to, the, to 0, we're going to get a more uh, accurate approximation, okay, a better approximation. You can't really set h equal to 0 because you can't divide by 0 numerically. But the smaller the h, the, more, the closer your approximation is, okay? to the true value. And indeed, if you notice, in the, the previous error was 0 0.6. This one is 0 0.06. So one order of magnitude difference, OK? It's indeed produced, it indeed produced a smaller error, OK? OK, great. Now, before I get to a very important point that one of your colleagues raised, um, I need to make this statement. Like, this error, however, doesn't really tell you how large the error is. So when I say the error with the smaller h is one order of magnitude than the previous h, that's a true statement, but in a way it's meaningless. Because that error, I did not put it in context. So here's why. A one-foot error in measuring a 1,000-foot a bridge is insignificant compared to a one-inch error committed in measuring a 10-inch table. Don't you agree? Right? Why? Because one foot over 1,000 feet is insignificant versus one inch over 10 inches. That's a big deal. That's 10% of the length of that table. Right? So we introduced the concept of relative true error. To be accurate and more honest about your error reporting, your errors need to be relative to some value that represents the system. In this case, that value is the true value. So we simply define the relative true error, and now I give it the symbol epsilon as opposed to capital E, as your true error over the true value. So now we have a reference with which to evaluate how the error is changing. Yes? Sorry, are these on Canvas? The they are on Canvas. Yeah. I think some of you are following them uh, actually right now. Yes? Is this similar to percentage? Yes. Okay. Yes. So this is, so your colleague just said that this is a fraction, right? So that's really a percentage. So you're going to express that as a percentage? Yeah. 
It is the same. When you, if you multiply it by 100%, it gives you a percentage. A fraction is a percentage, right? So now this is going to give you a value between 0 and 1. Always. It normalizes it. Okay? Now in the example we did with the exponential, the true value of the, of the approximation was 4. So it wasn't, if it was 1, it wouldn't be an issue. But it was 4, so that's not really 1. If it was 100, it would have been a big deal. We couldn't compare the errors. But with relative error, you can compare the errors. Okay, there's, do you guys need my help over there? Pardon me? On the main page? Yeah, just over there. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Okay. Okay. So now we define the relative error as the true error divided by the true value. Okay? We typically take the absolute value of that and multiply by 100% to report a percentage. Because when you divide the true error by the true value, that's going to always give you a value between 0 and 1. So it's a fraction. It could be like 0 0.5 or 0 0.3. And you report that as 30%. So you would say my true relative error is 30%. And people will get that. Scientists and engineers will get that because we're going to beat that into your mind. So when you graduate out here and someone tells you, oh, we reported a relative error of 15%, you're like, okay, yeah, I know what you're talking about, okay? This is what you're talking about. So now we're going to go and do this example. A one meter error is committed in measuring a 100 meter bridge and a 10 meter bridge suspension. So same error, we have a device that is notoriously known to commit a one meter error in anything it measures. So we use it to measure a 100 meter bridge and we use it to measure a 10 meter bridge suspension. So which of these errors is worse? Okay. You can do a calculation or you can just uh, talk theory about it. So what's, what's interesting about this problem is that the error is the same between two measurements. It is one meter. The error is the same. But you can't, if you go and say, well, the error is the same in both measurements. But that is not a useful statement because, yes, numerically it's the same, but it is less significant in one case than in the other. That's why you need a relative error. Okay, that's why you need the relative error. If you were to use just the absolute error or the true error, non-relative error, you'd be committing, it's not, a, you, it's a fact, yes, it's the same value of the error, but it's out of context, right? So here's how I would solve this. Clearly, I know that I can tell immediately that in the one meter error for the 100 meter suspension, is insignificant compared to a 1 meter error in a 10 meter suspension, okay? Because in this case, it's 10% 10, it's 10 of the error. In that case, it's 1% of the, of the suspension, okay? So, you know, here's how I would do it. True value for the bridge is 100 meter. True error is 1 meter. And the relative error, relative true error is 1%. And for the suspension, true value is 10 meters. True error is one meter, and then the relative error is 10%. So then the error in measuring the suspension is more significant than the error is in measuring the bridge, okay? Relative errors are almost always the thing to report. You always report relative errors, okay? Always report relative errors. Put them in absolute values unless the sign of the error is important, okay? But usually it's not. So those are the true errors, okay? True errors, those are the definitions. Now, here's the question. I'm gonna make a claim that true error does not make sense, okay? Can, can you 
think about why that is the case. Go. And I'll give you a break after that. <laughs> What was that? I just said, I don't know. You're already using an approximated value to begin with. Okay, okay. So you're on the right track, right? But it's the other value in the definition. So you have true value minus approximate value, right? Yeah. How much on PDF? Uh -huh. When we're doing it, we're doing it in Python, obviously. Uh -huh. Are we allowed to do it just in, let me just pull up the homework. Copy and paste, sure. OK. Well, no, that's what I meant. Do we actually, so in this case, I'm. Do you want to do the activity, and then we can discuss oh, this not. after? Yeah, we talked about it. OK. OK. Um, so <laughs> In, in Markdown, yeah, 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 that's fine. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you might need to do some calculations, right? Or if you did them on your calculator, that's fine. Yeah, yeah. But your homework too, you're gonna need to use Python, so that's okay. Yeah, yeah. This is this is the first homework, so it'll be fine. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Get the numbers from the table, but format it nicely, right? And the it's up to you. Just produce something that is, you know, looks okay, right? So what I would put is create a table and put the error next to each one of those, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Do we have any answers? Do you have any comments? Of the true error. Oh. Let's say relative true error, so it's dimensionless. Yeah, but still, the number will be meaningless if we don't know the, the scale of the true value. Yeah. But you know the true value, right? Because it's true value minus approximate value. Uh, pardon me? You don't know what it's in relation to? You do, because it is divided by the true value. Oh, okay, so we're talking. Relative or approximate, uh, relative or um, non relative, you know the true value. No way to compare errors. Uh, hey, guys, let's, yeah, let's listen to each other. The significance of an error. That's generally right in the general case, but there's something a little bit more specific to the concept of the true error okay, that I'm trying to get out of here. Ah, no, you can't participate, TA team. Is it because it's really impossible to measure a true value? Like, no matter what you use to measure, the measure yeah. So yeah, so the, the, the point is, if we know the true value, and that's the point your colleague was making to me a minute ago, why would we even bother compute an approximate value? So in reality, the true error, there's n it's, it's silly to even compute a true error, because if you know the true value, you just take that true value and live, move on with your life with that. Right? You don't need an approximate value for that, except in a few cases. Okay? So if we know the true value, why bother with computing the approximate value? That's generally correct. However, however, there are cases when we are writing code. We are developing a mathematical theory. And we want to test that theory. What do you test it on? You test it on systems on theoretical systems or on systems where you know the true answer. So like in this case, I created an approximation or a derivative approximation, which is fx plus h minus f of x over h. How do I test that? How do I test that this approximation is going to give me realistic answers or good answers? I go and test it with a system where I know the true value. That's called verification and validation in numerical methods in the larger context, okay? 
So you will see when I told you in the homework assignment, you write a little function or a little code, go test it on a system you know the answer to. So that you know that at least it's giving you a ballpark answer or the right answer, okay? That's the only value of the true error. But in practice, when we go and deal with realistic systems, we have no clue what the true value is. Oftentimes, we only know the true value for very simplified situations. So this, ex this example again, excuse me, I create an approximation for the derivative. Yay! But then I want to go immediately apply it to a very complex function that I don't know the derivative uh, to the exact derivative. How can I trust my result? Well, you ask me, how do I trust your derivative approximation, Dr. Saad? How do I trust it? I was like, ah, we tested, I'll tell you, we tested this derivative approximation on a few hundred problems where we know the true derivative, and these are the errors we got, so we have good confidence in our approximation. So that's the value of the true error. Beyond that, it's really not useful in practical situations. Right, let's take five. Um, we got a few minutes left. Let's just introduce the concept of the approximate error. Okay, and uh, we'll call it a day. So, if you recall my argument, if you don't mind focusing with me now and reserve all discussions for the future, okay, my argument was that the true error is hardly useful beyond verification and validation. You know, another example we gave was Suppose you're developing a cheap sensor to measure something, okay? Like a radon sensor for your home, but you don't want to spend $1,000 on a high accuracy sensor, right? You develop your cheaper sensor, which has less accuracy, but you want to figure out like, okay, how well does it do, right? How well does it do? So you go ahead and compare it to the higher accuracy sensor, which is supposedly closer to the truth, right? Now, the higher accuracy sensor was designed by using very controlled conditions. So you'd create perhaps a, an enclosure, you would specify, you would input a certain radiation level of radon or concentration, you measure it with the high accuracy sensor, you measure the error, you understand how that sensor works, so that's the usefulness of the true error, but then you take that high accuracy sensor and you treat that as the truth, essentially. Okay? But in reality, when we are going in real life, you're computing complex systems, we don't know the true value. If you know the true value, you don't need an approximation. If you know the true value, you can just move on. And if you can measure it somehow, then just move on. The true value then is useful when designing, calibrating methods. Okay? But beyond that, it's not. Now, in practice, how do you measure your actual error in more complex systems? If you don't have the true value, we introduce the concept of the approximate error. And I'm going to give the definition. It's going to sound so weird right now, but it will become clear once we start doing some examples. We, we're probably not going to have time to do an example today. But oftentimes in numerical methods, um, we are doing what's called an iterative process. Okay? You have to iterate over a system or an equation or a formula over and over and over again. You start with an initial value and you start improving, improving, improving that value because theory and the mathematicians tell us if you keep doing that, you're going to get to the true answer. Okay? Now what that means with every improvement, you are gaining better and better and better accuracy, more significant digits if you want. Okay? So what that means the current approximation or the current iteration is a little bit better than the previous one. So we say, hey, you know, let's define our current approximate error as the current approximation minus the previous approximation or the current iteration minus the previous iteration or a higher accuracy approximation minus a lower accuracy approximation. So that last statement, the difference between the higher accuracy and the lower accuracy that is, compare, take that and compare it to the radon sensor example. You have a low-cost radon sensor and a high-accuracy radon sensor. Okay? How do you measure the error in your low-accuracy radon sensor? You compare it to the high-accuracy radon sensor because you have more trust in the 
high accuracy radon sensor. And then you say, you know, I am willing to tolerate a 10% error in my measurements. And if, if the difference in all your experiments give you an error less than 10%, then you're doing good, okay? If in some experiments it goes beyond, then you might have to assess that, okay? So I think we'll call it a day with this, and we'll resume next Tuesday. Have a nice weekend, okay? There's a help session um, at 4 o'clock today, okay? So make sure you go to that if you need to, okay? Thank you.